Thanks so much. It's, it's, as always, it's a pleasure to be here at IAS. Uh, um, and so I'm going to talk about the subject that I spoke here about uh, six, seven years ago. So there's been some progress since then, and that's, uh, that's what I'm reporting on today. Uh, uh, so let me, let me um, begin with some notation and set up. Uh, so let me introduce the main object to the talk. So as usual, m omega for me is going to be a closed and connected symplectic manifold. And all the results of the talk will apply to the case where uh, the manifold is aspherical. So I, I will assume that omega vanishes on pi 2, and so does c1. I should have just said, er, I think almost everything I said. Uh, so I'll, I'll put the names of my collaborators on the board when I state the main theorem. But everything I, I present today is joint work with Lev Bohovsky and Vincent Omelier. Uh, so I'll denote this set of Hamiltonian diffios by ham of m and as, as you guys know if you're interested in C0 symplectic geometry studying Hamiltonian homeos so these are Hamiltonian Hamiltonian homeomorphisms and here is the definition I'll take for today so the definition is take the closure of ham so here's a notation and a definition. Take the closure inside homeomorphisms. So this is C0 closure. So these are precisely those homeomorphisms of the manifold, which you can write as C0 limits of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. OK, so uh, I got to introduce one more thing before I tell you a couple more things before I could tell you the main theorem of the talk. So we're going to be talking about the talk is going to be about spectral numbers and in particular the spectral norm. So I'll, I'll give a brief re review of what spectral numbers are. So this theory was one of the guys who started it was Claude Viterbo, Schwartz, and O. So this was in the case of R2n, early 90s, around 2000, Schwartz extended the definition to aspherical manifolds, which, which is what I'm interested in today. And then O extended it to more general settings. So I'll, I'll just quickly recall what spectral numbers are. So keeping in mind that the manifold is aspherical. So let's start with a time-dependent Hamiltonian in our symplectic manifold. Okay, and we all know that Hamiltonian floor homology, so it gives you, you know, using Hamiltonian floor homology, you could construct a one parameter family of vector spaces. So I'll denote it by HFT of H. So this is the filtered floor homology of the, the Hamiltonian. Uh, so here T is, R, is in R. And so this is, I won't repeat the part, this is the homology of a complex generated by the one periodic orbits of the, the Hamiltonian. And if you look at this complex, so let's look at it for values of t which are very, very small. Then this floor homology group is, then this is 0, because there is nothing there. And if you look at t very large, then you get this is Flores theorem, then this is isomorphic to the, probably <coughs> people can't read what's here, to the singular homology of the manifold. So I'll, I'll rewrite this on this board again. Okay, so let's keep that in mind and I'll tell you how to define uh, the spectral numbers associated to a singular homology class. So take, take a homology class alpha, non-zero, and and now I'm going to rewrite what's on that board. So again, recall, if t is much smaller than zero, then you cannot see alpha in, in the floor homology, in the filter floor homology at level t, because this is zero, right? Just because, because this is zero. 
And then if t is much bigger than 0, then obviously you can see this, this singular homology class in the, in the filtered floor homology of H because this coincides with the, with the entire singular homology of the manifold. Okay, So there exists some t in between where this change happens. Uh, there is the smallest t where you go from not seeing alpha to seeing alpha. And that's what's called a spectral number. So C definition, C of alpha h is equal to, uh, so I could define in terms of an n for a soup. So let's say infimum of times uh, actions t such that alpha is in, you can see alpha in the filtered flow homology. Okay. I mean, this is kind of a, it's not a very, very precise definition, but it's just a recollection of how you define these numbers, okay? And there are two, there are two numbers that I'm very interested in. Uh, is, is this enough, or should I, should I give more background on what these numbers are? I don't know, maybe. It's okay. So there are two of them I'm really interested in, is when you take alpha to be m, so you get C of M comma H. Usually people call it C plus of H. And then when you take alpha to be this, the smallest one, point, the class of the point, this is called C of point H. Uh, this is called C minus of H. Okay. Now, there is there's a norm called the spectral norm, which is exactly the difference between these two values. So gamma uh, of H is defined to be C plus minus C minus. So this is kind of the action window in floor homology where you start seeing, uh, you know, at this height you begin to see some things from the singular homology of the manifold, and then you reach this height where you you see, you've seen everything. So this is the window in which you see all of the singular homology of the manifold. And it turns out, so I don't know if this is a, it's not very difficult to check on, maybe it is actually, I don't remember. Gamma, <laughs> uh, if, if you have two Hamiltonians, so this is my notation for the time one map of a Hamiltonian flow, if you have two Hamiltonians with the same which give you the same diffeomorphism, then gamma of H equals gamma of G. Okay, so in fact, this doesn't depend on the Hamiltonian. It's, it gives you, it gives you a, a well-defined function from the space of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms to the real line. So but that's not entirely trivial. This is not trivial, you're right. This is actually, this follows from, I think, this is, proven by, in the paper of Schwartz, and I think it uses some results of Seidel. It, it follows from the fact that the Seidel morphism is trivial on aspherical manifolds. You're right, so this fact is, I mean, this, the, you could define this gamma on other manifolds too, but then uh, it would define on a choice. It's only well defined on the universal cover of Ham, but here it's defined on Ham. And gamma is, in fact, is, I, I use the word norm because it is a norm. What do I mean here is it, it, it has, so gamma is a norm, it has the following properties. Um, so gamma of phi of any diffeomorphism phi is always greater than or equal to zero and gamma of phi equals zero if and only if phi is actually the identity. So that's one thing that follows from being a norm. Another property of being a norm is that a norm on a group must satisfy this property. Okay. And the third property of being a norm is uh, triangle inequality. None of this stuff is obvious, by the way. Uh, I mean, it's, this is non-trivial stuff. So I'm, I'm just recalling what this gamma, some properties it has. And it has this extra feature that is conjugation invariant. Okay. 
And so the main guy I'm interested in talking about, the, the, the pr protagonist of my talk, is this spectral norm. So this was, this gives you a conjugation invariant norm on the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. And this is kind of a non-trivial fact. It's not easy to construct conjugation invariant norms uh, on infinite dimensional Lie groups. Uh, no, it's an interval. It's, uh, you know, there exists some value t. You mean this set? Yeah. It's, it's something like this, actually. It's like, uh, uh, it's an interval of this form. So, uh, I mean, the minimum value is c of alpha h, so the, I'll, I'll write it as c. It's of this form. So once you start seeing it there, you see it forever. You're right. I guess from the definition I've given, it's not obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I ha that's a point. Yeah. Right. As Helmut's saying, you have this inclusion of the reason is this. So this definition I've given is it's not at all obvious that it's uh, well defined. I'm, I'm hiding a lot of stuff in the background, but you have this inclusion maps. The maps are induced by inclusion. Okay, and then this factors into like the full floor homology. So if it's non-zero here, it's non-zero here, and it's and in fact the definition uses the, the if you want to give a precise definition, you have to go through this. Thanks for the question. So what I wanted to say is that the, so this this spectral norm has kind of been a, an, an important well the fact that such a thing exists that a bi-invariant norm on the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphism is a really uh, a non-trivial thing. And there is another one, the, a more famous bi-invariant norm or a conjugation invariant norm. That's the Hofer norm. So the story goes that maybe Helmut could verify if this legend is true, that Yasha was looking for, Ilya Ashberg was looking for such things. And he posed the question to you. The story is even more interesting. So oh. I gave it as, uh, I was at Rutgers, and there was a student who was working with Francois Trelitz, and he wanted to change advisors because he wanted to do something <coughs> exciting. So he came to me and would have been my first student. And I, I uh, and with the first student, you still have a lot of tender loving care. And I gave a PhD topic, was basically in modern terms to find proof for geometry. So I, so I knew that you could do this. And then he decided it's boring and change advisors. <laughs> and so, 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 so then, I, then, then uh, I had this in my draw, and then Yasha called me up and asked me if, if you have a sequence of Hamiltonian going to zero and the map converges to, the, to something, is this the identity? And then I, then I just said, so give me five minutes, and then I looked at my draw, and that was basically there, and said yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's even better than that. <laughs> So that, that's the story. Right. Right, in general, so if, if you take a finite dimensional Lie group, this is a fact from Lie group theory, and look for such an object, it would force the Lie group to be compact. This, so it, it's quite a surprising fact that you could find something on a non-compact Lie group, I mean, such large non-compact Lie group. Okay. Uh, and as I said, so there is gamma. This was constructed by Claude. And then there was also the, there's also the Hofer distance, which was constructed, the Hofer norm, which was constructed by Helmut. And these things have had, I mean, this is, have had a ton of applications in symplectic topology. There's so much you could prove with this spectral norm. Uh, and now I'm interested in this from the point of view of C0 symplectic geometry. So you could probably guess what the, the main theorem is going to be, or at least what the main theorem is is about, so as I said, this is joint work with Lev Bohovsky and Vincent Millier. Uh, just from a few months ago. Uh, so just to emphasize, again, we assume m omega is aspherical here. Now, so, uh, uh, so, so you've got this 
this map from Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms to the real line. Uh, just to overemphasize, you know, I, I'm going to put d sub c0 next to this. So I want to view ham as a metric space with the c0 distance. Or I'm just emphasizing that I put the c0 topology on ham. And now I claim that this map is continuous. So it's continuous with respect to the C0 topology on Ham. And not only that, furthermore, it extends continuously <coughs> to the closure. So in fact, you could define the gamma norm of every homeomorphism, every Hamiltonian homeomorphism. So maybe I'll put, I'll put this here. So that's that's the main statement. I'll uh, I'll talk about a few applications of this, and maybe I'll indicate what the what goes into the proof of the theorem. That that's that's the plan of the talk today. Are there any questions? I'll, I'll make a couple of remarks about the statement. So oh, I should say. This sort of statement was, so if you look at the case of R2n and compactly supported Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of R2n, this was proven in the initial paper of Claude, uh, so in the 90s. Then the next setting was when m is a surface. And this was done by me. Uh, uh, so a closed surface, this was done around 2011 or so. And I gave a talk here on it in, in 2011, so around seven years ago. Uh, and then, so now we've got all aspherical manifolds. And very recently, as of two weeks ago, or maybe three weeks ago, in the case of CPN, so uh, uh, Egor Shaluchin has uh, put a proof of this on the archive in the case of CPN. So these are the class of manifolds for which, at the moment, we know continuity of gamma. Oh, good question. So they do. Uh, that, that, uh, I'll talk about it. In fact, one co corollary is that, so if you notice, I mean, this gamma is the difference between two spectral numbers. So the difference extends. And then it, it follows that the difference between any two spectral numbers extends. But a, a specific spectral number itself, no, because, well, Spectral numbers are not even fully well defined for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. They depend on the choice of a Hamiltonian. You see, the, uh, you, in the definition, you use a Hamiltonian H. So if I take the Hamiltonian and shift it by constant, it doesn't change the diffeomorphism, but it shifts the numbers by constant. Like normalized. OK, so you normalize the Hamiltonian. And one question is, this could be the first remark. So you could define. Uh, so C plus, even C plus of H, where H normalized. So this normalized is key here. <coughs> so you could define this to be C plus of phi. I mean, that's the common thing that people do, actually, uh, uh, in a lot of papers. If you define it this way, this is not C0 continuous. Not C0 continuous. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll expand on this. Let me expand on this, because this, so what, here's what I mean. Define C plus of phi. So y you wanted to define a C, you asked me if it's continuous or not. So you want the C plus, you want the number C plus of phi, or did I call C plus, right? Or the spectral number associated to a Hamiltonian. So let me say C of alpha phi. So you have a homology class, and I want to define C of alpha phi. As you see in the definition, you need to pick a Hamiltonian H. So now normalize the Hamiltonian and define it to be C of alpha H, where H is, uh, when you said normalized, did you mean mean normalized? Or did you mean just does there exist normal? Or maybe it's compactly supported in D. Ah, so I mean the manifold is closed. So it's yeah, okay, mean then. So the, the standard thing is mean normalization, i.e., i.e., you subtract the constant such that this, this integral 
you know, over S1 over M is zero. That's the, that's the standard convention. Okay, then my claim is there exists phi i such that phi i C0 converges to identity, but C plus of phi i does not converge uh, does not converge to zero because that would be C plus of identity. So the spectral numbers themselves are not, and I'll give you the example actually, are not C0 continuous. It's the difference that's continuous. Okay? It has something to do with the topology, how I get there by H or why is that? This, I'll, I'll show you the example. Why is this? Okay, like before you show me, can you say? Oh, it's because this, this quantity, it's roughly speaking, is kind of like a Calabi invariant. If, uh, it, it, this quantity is just not C0 continuous. I mean, this has nothing to do. You could have things which are very C0 small for which this quantity is very, uh, it could be whatever. And th that's how the example is constructed. Here it is, example. So take, uh, take a ball and take this Hamiltonian. This not mean normalized. So maybe I'll call this F. F, F sub I. This ball has radius, I'll take it such that the ball has radius 1 over I. Okay? Then note, uh, the C0 distance of the time one map of the flow from identity goes to 0 because it's less than 1 over i. So it goes to 0. So this thing, actually, the entire flow converges to, z to identity. So the height of that is 1 over i? No, the, the height is, uh, the, the radius of the ball is, the radius of the support is 1 over i. So, so no point could move the further. The you height is whatever you want it. Take one billion. No, I don't want it fixed. Uh, take one billion? No, I take it. I want this condition. Integral of fi equals i. Right? So this, the heights are growing. So then, to mean normalize, I'd have to subtract this number from fi to get hi, which are mean normalized. Then the spectral invariance, you could show that the spectral invariance actually are exactly i or minus i for the mean normalized guy. Okay? Then check C plus of hi, the mean normalized guy, is like is I think either i or minus i, plus minus i, is minus i. Because hi is fi minus i. You have to subtract i to mean normalize it. I was going to give this example and say my first remark was going to be that the Hofer norm is also not C0 continuous by this same example. Uh, is the example clear? This is kind of, this is, a, this is the canonical counterexample to any time. If you, if you have some sort of a C0 continuity statement, the first thing you've got to test it on is this, this example. So the spectral numbers themselves are not C0 continuous. But as soon as you look at the difference between two spectral numbers, then this kind of sort of arbitrary, this is, this is from a C0 point of view, this sort of mean normalization, the mean normalization is kind of an arbitrary thing to do. This goes away. This gets canceled out. And then, and then it does become C0 continuous. So just to make sure, any difference between two spectral Yes. So, yes. In fact, so maybe I'll make that the next remark. The next remark is that if you look at this, define uh, so here, look at C of alpha H minus C of beta H. This, uh, maybe I'll call this, I don't know, gamma sub, gamma alpha beta of phi, okay? So gamma of phi was when alpha was a fundamental class and point now say just take any two arbitrary classes. This only depends on the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, so it doesn't depend on choice. And again, the same theorem is true. Gamma alpha beta of phi, it, it, this is C0 continuous. And extends to the closure. And the reason is very simple to ham bar. The reason is very simple, at least in this setting, is that because, yeah, <laughs> is, this is bounded by gamma of phi. 
okay? Because all the spectral numbers, this is the smallest one. Uh, the, the one associated with the point is the smallest one, and the one associated with the fundamental class is the biggest one, so everything else. And in fact, I'll make another vague remark because I, I, I won't have time to go through this. You could show it follows from this, a corollary of this result is that can define not just, so, so this, this, what I just said says that you could define the difference between any two spectral invariants for, for a Hamiltonian homeomorphism. So meaning you could define a set of spectral invariants up to a shift. But in fact, you could do more. can define the filtered floor homology of phi up to a shift. And this is uh, in terms of barcodes. So this would be a long story, so I won't go through it. But you can actually define the filtered floor homology of phi for phi in, in the closure of Ham. And that's a consequence of this result. So this uses some uh, results of Kislev and Schluchen. So I'll just say that. So in fact, in fact, it turns out that not only can you define the spectral norm, but you could actually now define the floor homology groups of a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, the filtered floor homology groups. Okay? You have a barcode. It, that's exactly what I mean. There, you have a barcode, but the barcode is well defined up to a shift, just for the same reason that this difference was. So th th that's how you would make this precise, that the barcode map is C0 continuous and so on, and extends to the closure. <laughs> Okay, so that, that's, you know, the, the, the significance to us in C0 symplectic geometry of a statement like this or this barcode thing is that now we have tools or more tools than we used to at least to study homeomorphisms because usually one of the biggest obstacles in C0 symplectic topology is that, uh, you know, pseudo-homorphic curves, you, you just can't write them down for a homeomorphism. And now as a consequence of these results, at least we have some set of new tools. And I'll show you some applications of these tools. Yes? Yes. So is there some analog statement in Bohr's theory? Can you take just Bohr's theory and kind of extend to, con uh, to, to continuous? Oh, yeah. Yes, but uh, that's by taking limits. Yeah, but that's kind of quite, uh, uh, in Morse theory, these spectral numbers satisfy the following property. It's like Hofer continuity, basically. I mean, if you look at C of alpha H minus C of alpha G, then you have this sort of inequality. Uh, let's say, I mean, you could take the whole for norm or the soup norm of this guy. So then when you pass to a continuous function, it's quite easy. But uh, that's continuity in the Hamiltonian. Well, we are talking about continuity in the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. So it's, so it's a different statement, although that's used to prove this statement. Yes? So, so if you have a continuity of Barcodes in particular, you know that the Betty numbers are the same as what you had before, which is yeah, so but, but you have this counter example to yes. the oh, that's that's of Devin. Okay. Yes, okay, so that's gonna be one of the applications. This is gonna come up. Uh, that was gonna be application number two, but I could start with application number two actually. Okay, so I'll answer that question in a second. Are there other questions? Uh, okay, so let's do application one. Uh, so Applications of this result. Uh, applications, number one is uh, Arnold conjecture. So on this board, I guess everybody knows that the statement of the Arnold conjecture. Uh, wait, so take, uh, it says for any Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of a symplectic manifold, uh, the number of fixed points, I mean, there are many statements, but the one I'll take is this one because that's the one that's convenient for me. So it's greater than cup length of m plus 1. OK, so that's the statement of the Arnold conjecture. And
as you just mentioned, so there is a counterexample for homeomorphisms. So let's just recall. Uh, wait a second. Yeah. So, so there was a theorem that we proved a few years ago, again, with Lev Bohovsky and Vincent Millier. We showed that on any closed symplectic manifold of dimension greater than or equal to 4, so here it doesn't have to be a spherical, but OK. Then there exists uh, a Hamiltonian homeomorphism. Uh, which has exactly one fixed point. OK, so, so this statement, it says that you know, if you just count the number of fixed points, then, then you don't get the Arnold conjecture. And uh, now what I want to tell you is that, so people told us this was not very good. This was a bad thing that we showed the Arnold conjecture. I mean, I don't know if it was a bad thing or not, but it looked like. I think I told you it's great. You said it's great because maybe. Uh, but because you have to put some weight on this. Right. Oh, yeah, if you, we count things with weights. Yeah. yeah, so, right, so we, we basically we had to go about finding a reformulation. I mean, it's bad if our old conjecture is true. So you want to make it, f it's bad if it's false. You want to make it true. So, <laughs> so, okay, so we went and worked hard to make it true <laughs> uh, by changing the statement. So I'll, I'll change the statement and I'll show you something that's actually true. So reformulation, reformulation uh, of Arnold conjecture. So we don't exactly have weights on the fixed points, but so maybe there's still more work to be done. But there's something else we could count. And the idea is to start counting uh, the total number of spectral invariants. Uh, which, which, as we just discussed, so you could define kind of spectral invariance up to a shift. And now we say, let's count spectral invariance as well as fixed points. So, so just let me make the remarks. So now we can, so as a consequence of the main theorem, we can make sense of the number of spectral invariants. Uh, of yes, you could say the number of infinite bars in the barcode, uh, or you could uh, you could define this. I define this difference there, c of alpha h. So this gamma of alpha beta of phi. Uh, you could say this. There's several ways to say this. One is that number of infinite bars in in barcode. So that works for anyone who knows what barcodes are. And if you don't know what barcodes are, you could look at the number of entries, the cardinality of this set. Uh, look at gamma of alpha and then point. So fix beta to be point phi. So this is, just remember this is, well, actually, no, that's, that's all right. So you look at the differences of spectral invariance. And this quantity is continuous and makes OK? So this is kind of the, the number of spectral invariants. And we are saying, let's count these as well as the fixed points. So keep in mind, counting these is not enough to get the Arnold. You know, the total number of those could be one, even for a smooth guy. Because for example, for the identity, they're all the same. So maybe I'll make the remark, even if phi is in ham and not in the closure, uh, the number of spectral invariants can be uh, just less than the couplet. It could be one. Just take the identity. But for every example of such kind, it turns out that if, if the number of spectral invariants is too few, you could check that the number of fixed points is actually infinite. There, there, is, there is a theorem that proves that. And basically, that's what we now prove. We show that the same statement is true in C0 settings. So here's the theorem that we claim recovers the Arnold conjecture. And the statement is this. If the number of spectral invariants 
of phi is smaller than the cup length of m plus 1, then the fixed point set of phi is, uh, is infinite. In fact, the statement is stronger than this. Uh, we can show the fixed point set has non-trivial topology. Uh, but I, I won't, like, it can't be for, it, it could be a circle, for example, but it can't be a contractible circle. It has, it has non-trivial topology in the manifold. Okay. In particular, uh, I mean, I don't know if I should add anything else to this. It does, uh, so in particular, the following is true. This, uh, this is kind of a silly statement, so I don't know if I should put it on the board or not, but I will. Uh, if you look at uh, the number, the maximum of number of fixed points and number of spectral invariants, if you look at the maximum of these two, then you certainly get the Arnold conjecture. But I mean, the statement is much is stronger than that. But Okay, so this is what's true in C0 settings. Do you guys see, does everybody see that this recovers the Arnold conjecture in the smooth setting? Because if phi is smooth, so suppose phi is smooth. If the number of spectral invariance is too few, then it has lots of fixed points. So that's, you get the Arnold conjecture. And if the number of spectral invariance is bigger than the, the cup length of m plus 1, each spectral invariance action of a fixed point in the smooth setting. So then you have fixed points with so many different actions. So then it also recovers the Arnold conjecture. But in the C0 setting, you could have a guy with just one fixed point. And that guy has many, many different spectral invariants. Okay, so this is kind of, this is what we've been able to do with this sort of statements about. Uh, so can you then write another formula where you look at the fixed points, fixed points together with a weight coming from the spectral invariance? Yeah, so that I'm not so sure. Like, I, I don't really know how to geometrically, you know, if you take an isolated, take an isolated fixed point and you want to associate some spectral invariant to it, like in some action value, I, I don't really know how to do it. Yeah, so in some sense, but philosophically, it's a, there's a lot of complexity in that fixed point. Right? right. And so if one could sort of localize this and just say the sum of the fixed points with its complexity has to be greater or equal to couplings plus one, maybe. Uh huh. Not, so no. That looked to me like and, and in the smooth case, you cannot put so much complexity on it, except that you already created infinitely many quicker points because yeah. s uh, s several middle max characterizations are the same, yeah? or the spectral inverse are the same. Yeah. And in some sense, because of the, of, of the, con in the continuous category, you can mess it up so that this point, the neighbor of this point, carries a lot of stuff. Right, so right, right. So somehow, I, maybe one could do it. In dimension two, I think we could do it. Uh, but in dimension two, the Arnold conjecture is true for homeomorphism, so that's why I believe yes, one should be able to do it by Matsumoto's theorem. Or, uh, but uh, we haven't been able to define a local floor homology for. A f in the smooth case, the sum of the ranks. Yeah. Right. That's the. Right. So that's. Uh, the, the, na the natural thing would be to define local floor homology of fixed point and then take them with the weight of rank of local floor homology, but. Uh, I don't know how to do that yet. Maybe, maybe there is next talk. Next talk. Seven, se seven years. Uh, seven years from now. <laughs> seven. There are these uh, homeomorphisms which are more special than than the Hamiltonian homeomorphisms I define, like the ones uh, that were defined by Muller and O, which come with continuous Hamiltonians. And there, since so you know, for example, for for an arbitrary homeomorphism, you don't even have a Hamiltonian to work with. But for a certain class, you have Hamiltonians. Maybe there you could define like some sort of local floor homology. There's more, so there's a chance that might work in for these so-called homeomorphisms. I think there is for sure. If, if there are finitely many fixed points and they are isolated, then for sure there is a coin index of so there be homeomorphisms. Yeah. 
Next talk, maybe. Okay, next question. C zero subjective structures on S four. I <laughs> so. I don't know how to get C0 symplectic structures on S4 using this, but uh, this, should, this could maybe serve as an obstruction. Yeah, if, 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 if this stuff shows more and more the properties of symplectic geometry, then I think C0 symplectic structures may not exist because there's too much invariance. Maybe. So maybe on S4, yeah. Well, so if, if you have a symplectic structure on S4, maybe you could uh, define this gamma somehow for whatever Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of S, homeomorphisms of S4 are supposed to be. Uh, OK, but I don't know. Um, any questions? <laughs> I wonder what the Arnold conjecture in S4 would be. So my it's is false, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe I'll keep this on the board for now. Maybe I'll show you application 2. Uh, or if people want to see the proof, I could show the proof. Is there a preference? Sorry? Oh, this was application one, was the Arnold conjecture. Uh, so is there a preference? Or I'll, I'll show you application two as well. And then if there's time, we'll discuss the proof a little bit. Oh, yeah, you're right. This was application two, but I, I skipped application one. OK, so the application two is, uh, so application two. There's a couple more in the paper, but OK, this two is enough, I think, for the talk. Uh, here's a definition due to Glasner and Weiss. Uh, so. From what I understand, they're both, uh, uh, these guys are ergodic theorists. And I think one of them is at, at least one of them is at Tel Aviv. I mean, yeah. So they say, uh, take a topological group, a topological group G. Uh, we say it is, G is Rochlin, or has the Rochlin property if uh, G has a dense conjugacy class. So what I mean is, I think it's clear what this means, but I'll just spell it out. So you look at the conjugacy class of taking an entry G in the group, uh, look at this conjugacy class. And then you have a topology here, so you could take the closure. So if this, the closure for some, so if there exists G such that the closure of a conjugacy class is the entire group, then the group is called Rochlin. And so for some reason, this sorts of things, uh, I mean, I looked at their paper, but now I can't remember exactly why, but these sorts of things come up in ergodic theory. Uh, so they give. They have a number of papers on the subject, and they give examples of Rochlin groups. So examples of groups which are Rochlin are, for example, uh, take a measure space x with a probability measure that needs to be sufficiently well. So for example, no uh, is non-atomic. And then you could look at the automorphisms of this. And there is a natural topology on the space of automorphisms of of measure preserving automorphisms of a measure of probability space it's called the weak topology. <laughs> and this is kind of the, the primary example that they give is, is Rochlin. And apparently, this was either, I think, proven by Rochlin himself. That's maybe where the name comes from. Uh, so that's one example. I mean, it doesn't really relate to the rest of the talk, so I won't say what the topology is. They give other examples, which uh, looks like I forgot to write down, but one example that's going to come closer. So they give a list of groups which have this property. One that's interesting to us would be is the group of homeomorphisms of 
the two sphere. So this has a dense conjugacy class. And in fact, this works, uh, seems like their construction actually works on any, uh, all even dimensional spheres, but you have to take the connected component of identity. Okay, so this, that's an example of a group that has a dense conjugacy class. And what I'm going to show is that um, this tools from symplectic topology, uh, you know, for some sort of rigidity on uh, Hamiltonian homeomorphism that forces them to be not roughly. And actually, the proof is quite simple. So, so the, the next application is that Hamiltonian homeomorphisms is not roughly. The homeomorphism, which has a dense. Yes. Can I do it for you for the disk? Because then I'll do it on the disk, or uh, it works the same. So here is example of a guy with a dense conjugacy class. So take um, maybe I need to put. I'll do it for us too, because. I'm sure the same construction will work on all spheres. So take fi accountable, so i and n, uh, dense subset of, uh, of homeomorphisms of the disk which fix the boundary. So I'll, I'll construct for you uh, not the case of S2, but the dense subgroup on the homeomorphism of homeomorphisms of the disk which fix the boundary. And then it's easy to put this on S2 because everything in S2 has a fixed point and you could flatten it out. So, so it's enough to do it for the disk, actually. And then. That's it. So you see the example already? Yeah. So here's the disk. Now, these FIs. Up to conjugation, you could shrink their supports. You have like maps that shrink the support. They're not area preserving. So what you could do is you know, put a lot of disks, you know, I mean they have to be smaller and smaller, and you put the FIs in here. So when I say F1, I mean sh conjugate the support so that it has very small support, and then it's a conjugate of F1 that's in here. And so these guys are all in here, and then if you have like an arbitrary G. It's close to one of the FIs, so you could do a conjugation where you push, so it's say close to F1, you, you bring F1 all the way out to the near the bound, to take up the almost the entire area of the disk, and then push all these guys into like a small corner here. So that conjugate of F1 will be close to G. So that's the guy, and, and you could put this on the sphere too, and it's still dense on the sphere, the conjugates of class. But as you could see, you need to shrink the area. So it's a, so then the question is, can you do this on, on S2? And before even, so, so Glasner and Weiss were independently interested in this subject. I don't think they really looked at area preserving groups, but uh, their began Covizian, the case of S2 was actually a question of began Covizian law. And I think they, they weren't even thinking about, they weren't even aware of the works of these three guys, but they were aware of this example and they were interested if this happens on S2. Uh, they asked if area preserving, so Hamiltonian homeomorphisms of S2 is the same as area preserving homeomorphism of S2 is, is Rochlin or not. So that's actually how I, is, several years back, how I got interested in this, in this subject. And so, the theorem is that, in general, the group of Hamiltonian homeomorphisms is not roughly uh, if, uh, well, you'd see the proof. If, at least in this case, where uh, in the aspherical setting. And the proof is very simple. You could probably all see it. Suppose. Uh, take G different than identity, then you look at gamma of G. This is well defined by the main theorem. And it's different than zero. 
this can be shown. Well, that was part of the properties too. But anyway, you could show that this is different, larger than zero. But gamma is invariant under conjugation. So this, whatever this quantity is, it's the same. You got the same number on the conjugacy class, and gamma is continuous. So in fact, you got the same thing on the closure of the conjugacy class. So gamma is constant on the closure of the conjugacy class, and gamma of identity is zero. So that tells you identity cannot be here. Yeah, of course, in the homomorphism example, you have some of this conformance stuff. That can yes. Rising yes. So I have a quick ask other questions like you could have stuff, I mean, it depends now on the manifold, but you have conformal stuff acting on the group. Would that create? So it takes the symplectic map to have a turn on R, R, R to N, and then compactly support it. Then you let uh, conformal things conjugate the stuff. Yeah, and then you wonder what yeah, you, you get. Can ask soft questions. I don't know. One has to set up. Can ask questions. That would be maybe a better question. Well, I'd have to think about that. Uh, but uh, also, well, we'd have to find a good, good way. Like, because that would be bring you closer to that example. Yeah. The tools go out the window, maybe. So uh, wait, wait, questions. up to. Sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes it's no. That's yes. The that's, that's a nice theory. <laughs> <laughs> if the answer is always no, that's not very good. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, that's what we have to do here. I'll go think hard and try to make the answer yes for the next talk for a larger group. By the way, another example is. Uh, if you look at homeomorphisms of S1, that's also not Rochlin, because there you've got Poincaré rotation number that has the exact same properties as gamma. So all you need is really some continuous conjugacy invariant to prove this property. It, it boils down to producing conjugacy invariants which are continuous. OK. Um, if there are no questions, maybe I'll say a few words on the proof and then uh, and then we'll, we'll be done. So uh, proof of main theorem, uh, maybe I'll start here. I think a few minutes is enough because I gave the proof in dimension two uh, back right in here in 2011. So I, I can skip that part, I think. So modulo that, I'll, I'll give you the proof. Um, so what we will show is a so proof. I will show that if, so I'll show that if phi is C0 close to identity, then this implies, so I will show this, that gamma of phi is, uh, is close to 0, OK? That proves continuity at identity. This is a norm, so it has like a triangle inequality. So then it's easy to prove it elsewhere. Um, so there are two steps. Step one, uh, take u to be an open subset of m. And let's look at this uh, define. Here is what I call the set of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, which are supported compactly in the complement of U. So this is phi and ham, which fix every point on U. OK, so I mean, here's M, and here's my set U. And I look at things that just fix every point here pointwise. OK, and then the, I showed back in. 2011, that if you look at restriction of gamma to this subgroup, uh, then this is continuous and extends to the closure and so on. 
is continuous with respect to the C0 topology. So it boils down to reducing the, so what we were stuck on is, is reducing the, the main, uh, the general case to this case where things are identity on an open set. Okay, and that might sound easy at first glance, but it's actually kind of involved. So, <coughs> so step two would be then to prove some sort of a C0 fragmentation lemma. Uh, C0 frag, so fragmentation lemma, and I'll, I'll tell you what the statement is in dimension two. Suppose the dimension of the, your symplectic manifold is two, uh, and then uh, the statement of the lemma is this. So fix two balls inside M. So fix, uh, take uh, two balls B and B prime inside M. So again, this is M. Here's B. Here's B prime. Okay. Then there exists some sort of a lemma or a C0 fragmentation theorem that says, here's the proposition. It says, if phi is sufficiently C0 close to identity, then you can find a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism psi with the following properties. So first, the psi uh, will be supported inside B prime. So I'll, you know, I'll put the support, it's supported in here. And the second thing is that psi is an inverse to phi on B. Okay, so I find an inverse to, f to phi uh, on, on this set B, and this almost reduces it to the previous case, except that I need one more thing. And this last thing, so even getting the first two properties is, is not obvious, but this last part is what's very difficult to get. This psi will be C0 close to identity. Okay, and that's what's hard to get. So what you have to do is, you know, what to, to do this, uh, so this psi, psi is an inverse to phi on B. What you want to do is start with a restriction of phi inverse to B prime. This is an embedding of a C0 small embedding of a ball, and you want to extend it to a C0 small Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of the entire manifold. And this, uh, this is quite difficult to do. And in dimension two, this, is, this was done. So this is kind of like a folklore theorem in surface dynamics. I read the proof in a paper of Entoff, Poltrovich, and P. Uh, there are some proofs of results like this in papers of Leroux and others, but uh, uh, this is the proof that's easiest to read for symplectic geometers. Uh, but uh, th this sort of statement in dimension two goes back to, uh, I don't really know, maybe to the 70s or so. But the proof is very two-dimensional, okay? So that's, what, that's why we had continuity of gamma in dimension two. Oh, is, Maybe I'll explain why this implies continuity of gamma now. Um, so the proof of this statement is very two-dimensional. You could generalize it to higher dimensions for volume preserving, but not symplectic. So, Um, so look, uh, proposition, this proposition that I just put on the board plus theorem two, uh, what did I call the theorem from 2011, theorem two, plus theorem two, these two things combined together imply the main theorem. And this is kind of easy to see, it's because you write, note that gamma of, so I want to show gamma of phi is small. By triangle inequality, this is less than gamma of phi composed with psi plus gamma of psi inverse. That's just the triangle inequality for gamma. And I claim each of these numbers is small. The reason is this. So let's, let's look at this one. Phi composed with psi is of the form 
that appears in theorem two. It it's a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism whose support is in the complement of this ball B. And phi composed with psi is C0 small. Right? Because phi was C0 small and psi is C0 small. So that's, that's where constructing the psi to be C0 small is key. So then by theorem 2, you get gamma of phi composed with psi is close to 0. And then gamma of psi inverse is close to 0 by the same reasoning. It's even easier, in fact. Okay, so the obstruction to go into higher dimensions was finding a fragmentation lemma like this. And <coughs> uh, so I'm almost out of time. So if you haven't managed to solve that fragmentation theorem, it, it, it looks like a really challenging problem. Uh, what we've managed to do is Somehow, we, we, we found a trick that makes life uh, easier in higher dimensions. So if dimension of m is greater than 2, then we're going to play the following trick. And uh, so I won't, I'll stop quickly after this. So instead of proving a fragmentation theorem for phi, I'll show you that you could prove some sort of a weak fragmentation. I claim that you could prove some sort of a weak fragmentation theorem not for phi, but for this map. Take phi times phi inverse. So this is a map of m times m with the product symplectic structure, uh, so back to itself. So this is a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of this product. So it sends x, y to phi of x, phi inverse of y. OK, so it has a very special form. and. It's easy to check. So using some Kunath type formulas in floor homology, you could show that the gamma of this guy is just gamma of Oh. Am I using a so I guess this is in my notation is this phi. Sorry, that was I'm using phi to denote everything, but okay. Uh, so this is 2 times gamma of phi. So it's sufficient to, to prove that. So I, I'm done if I show that you could do the fragmentation theorem for this guy. And uh, what we show is that you could use the special structure that it has to actually prove a fragment. Some, some statement that's very similar to this, but uh, let's say almost the exact same statement for the big, this capital phi. And, and that's it. Maybe I'll stop here. Thanks.